more. No, no, no. Grit your teeth more, more. Shake, shake faster, faster. Welcome to Midsummer Maniacs. Hey, Maniacs. I'm Sarah. And I'm Mark. And this is Midsummer Maniacs, a podcast dedicated to the ITV series Midsummer Murders. Each week, we dig into an episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, and the loonies, and everything else that we love. We love the loonies. And just a warning at the top of the show, if you let your kids watch Midsummer Murders, the podcast is okay for them, but if uh, Midsummer Murders is too much for your kids, the podcast is probably too much for them, too. If minute-long shots of grown men's bare asses is too much for them, or for you. I thought last episode we had a lot of men bare ass, but <laughs> this episode has Up the ante. significantly more man bare ass. So we're talking about Electric Vendetta yes. this week. Season four, episode three. And I, I have to say, when we started this podcast, this is one of the episodes that came in to my mind when we thought, is this something we want to do? Will we have enough to talk about? And I thought, oh, that episode with that guy in the crop circle, we could talk about that for sure. No problem. What's funny to me is I remember we talked about this episode like way back in one of the other episodes, mm -hmm. and it felt like it was a million years to get to here. Yeah, because this has always been the creme de la creme of corpse acting. Well, it is. I, I, <laughs> like, there's, there's just not even a discussion to be had. No, no. Here. If there was an Oscar or a BAFTA or whatever for corpse acting, this episode's got it. Hello, I'm Mark, and the BAFTA award for best naked-ass acting goes to... <laughs> Uncredited guy. That, and that's the thing that bothers me the most, is he is completely uncredited. Both of them. Like, they deserve... To have their names in the credits. Something. There are several people that are uncredited in this also. So mm -hmm. I don't know who was doing the credits, but it was the same person who was trying to figure out who had, who killed Eddie Field. Because that's kind of, that ball got dropped too. Quickly, just a couple of things at the beginning. Filmed uh, July, August 2000. Broadcast date the 2nd of September 2001. Which becomes interesting here because we're coming up on 9-11 mm -hmm. in the broadcast history. And how that affects things. 9.9 .9 million viewers. Directed by Peter Smith. Who really has done 22 separate Midsummer episodes. Wow. He's kind of made a living, living of it. And written by Terry Hodgkinson. It's a good one. Yep. Absolutely. So our cold opening is a flashback. To a duel. Yes. It's like 20s or 30s. Oh. <laughs> they make it seem like it's like medieval times. They park a car in the background to give us some time reference because a giant tree and a manse is not enough to give us time reference in Britain. Now, where I come from in Canada is near a town where the last fatal duel in Canada took place. And this was like in the 1800s, mm -hmm. right? A 19th century thing. Were people fighting duels in Britain into the 19th century with swords? I think that kind of stuff might, it, it might be more realistic to think about it happening at a private school where fencing was one of the courses that they would have taken. I think and, this is at Oxford because they mentioned yeah. the Oxford. Yeah. And they were kind of taught the older ways of doing things. And so it was a tradition there. It might have died out every place else. I don't know. Really, this is crappy re uh, resolution to romantic relationships is what it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to say right now, I stake the claim, this episode doesn't happen if Isabel isn't an indecisive jerk when she's young. Make a choice. Yeah. But no, I'll kiss you on the cheek. And I'll kiss you on the cheek. You can't have both of your beefcakes and eat it too. Well. Make a decision. They are going right at it. And having them fight over her. As a woman, I'm sorry, that's not how I make my decisions. And also, I would want to be there. I would go there and stand between them and go, uh, stop. Dudes, stop. I don't want either of you if this is how you solve things. No. Jamais vaincu. Yeah. Once I have been defeated, I will speak French to you about never being defeated. Oh. Oh. Okay. So Peter loses. Yes. Christian cuts his cheek. It's first blood. Yeah. Their seconds are there and they walk off. Je <laughs> vaincu. So the, the guy who plays young Christian yeah. 
um, in that flashback, he's a very well-known actor now. He, he looked familiar. He's so young and fresh-faced. Punchy cheeks. Yeah, but um, he's like a major character in Westworld now. He's all over Westworld. What? So people might recognize him from there. Yes. Then we're brought to the present day, and I have to say, this episode has a lot of naked man ass, but it's got a lot of bonking, too. <laughs> Or near bonking. Or after après bonking. Yeah, we've got Steve and Sally in the field. Just a running buck and a Randy Young Doe. Do they not have any place else they could go? They've got to make out well, in you, Harry's field, his his father-in-law's field. You see, they can't afford a hotel. No, that's wrong. Well, they don't have like an estate of different houses. No, that's N- wrong. No, that's wrong. She doesn't have her own apartment they could go to. No, that's no, wrong. No, that's wrong. That he owns a car, well, a truck. A ute. A ute. Maybe they like it there. There are people who like it there, as we'll see later on. Too. Yeah, the teenagers like it there. Yes. It just seems like they would get caught all over the place. I can't believe that Harry doesn't. He, I think he knows full well they're in there. Well, and then they run off, and clearly Harry would be able to see them. I wanted to see the detectorists in the background. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the first time we get to see one of Sally's horrible necklaces. Sally and her, her neck clothes bands. and her necklaces are just horrific. They're perfect for the character. Yes. The wardrobe person did a great job. And she's a great actress. I think she does a great job with this part. Yeah. But it's a weird part. It's just a reprehensible person that she's playing with bad fashion taste. Yes. Well, she has poor taste in men also. (laughs) How can she choose? (laughs) (laughs) She goes from one bad choice to another. So Harry, Sir Harry, walks off and sees crop circles and a naked dude. They, in the crop circle. I can only imagine the location scout must have looked high and far for this spot because they found a field with a hill next to it that gives you a perfect vantage point to see a crop circle from ground level. Yes. It, it's it perfect. Is, it is perfect. The first time I saw the the... The angle where the police kind of set up their cordon and you can see the crop circle in the background. The first time I saw that scene, I thought it was faked. But then they walk right into it. It's not. It's just the perfect perspective on a field. And that dude, whoever he is, is out there by himself, nakedy naked. Ronald Stokes. Ronald Stokes. That's that's the character's name, but we have no idea no, who the is. We're just going to have to call him Ronald Stokes. So Ronnie's out there, nakedy naked. He and walked that- out in his robe, puts the robe <laughs> down, hides it somewhere. And no, it's because the UFO dropped him off there. <laughs> you don't think that's that really happened? Right. Oh, that's yeah. right. But as an actor, yeah, there's no like skin colored clothing that he's wearing he is absolutely naked no and not just that but with his mouth wide open yeah and this is just the scenes where barnaby and troy are talking to him yeah the scene in the morgue is it is bafta level acting and the actor must have agreed to allow part of his head to be shaved and uh, it's just amazing it's commitment to a role meanwhile back in town lady beatrice is going to pick up lloyd Yes. So Lady Beatrice is married to Sir Harry. Yep. But she's far closer to Lloyd. They've been friends since they were little. And she knows how much this will matter to him. So she picks him up to take him out to the field. But of course, Harry says that he's going to give him 20 minutes lead. But, you know, he's not going to because he thinks Lloyd's a jerk and he's jealous of him. So by the time they get there, the police are already there. In Lloyd Kirby's shop, the UFO Ufology Center... C dot E dot N dot T dot R dot E. <laughs> it's an acronym, but we don't know what it's we for. Have no idea what it's for. Maybe that'll be one of the questions. What is the acronym for Ufology Center? Yeah, if you know what the, the center should spell out. So there are a number of books in there that he's selling to people. Uh, th- that room is fantastically staged. Yeah. It has the, all the sorts set of, dresser did a really good job. Interesting things to look at it. There's communion by Whitney Stryber, who uh, is sort of the main. I'm gonna go out on a limb here. Fiction adduction person. Yeah. He also wrote. 
Did you know that he wrote Wolfen and The Hunger? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, he's had three books made into movies. But there Two are, of them are uh, okay. There are also <laughs> some supposedly nonfiction accounts of abductions, though, that are yes. there in the shop. So a book called UFO, Sightings UFO, and Saucer Wisdom, which if you buy two books, you get a third for half price. I would so shop at his store. Absolutely. <laughs> but one thing I saw, and I'm a nerd... I'm a maniac. <laughs> he has a piece of paper taped over his computer screen, like it's instructions or something. It's never referenced. It's never seen again. I'm like, would that not be the most annoying thing in the entire world to have a piece of paper over your computer like that? If it was a more modern day computer, a more current computer, I would think, oh, he's a conspiracy nut. He's paranoid. So he's like blocking his camera and his monitor. No, this is like a 1990. But it's a big computer. CRT monitor. Yeah. It's not like it's got a webcam built into it. No. But I still think that's kind of what the impression that we're supposed to get. But that whole center, even his little bed with his little saucers <laughs> over his bed. And his grass green nubby bed cover. It's just a piece of work. It's just an absolute piece of work. It's very well done. Such a great job. And they race out to the scene of the crime. His his UFO center is behind the Midsummer Parva post office run by Alice and Marion sisters yes. who, as soon as I saw them again, I thought, Oh, they're going to stand up from behind the counter later with googly eyes because there's a UFO going on. And I was like, no, baby, what are you talking about? It's because that post office and those two women remind me so much of the sisters who run the post office grocery store in the movie Saving Grace. Yes. With Brenda Blevlin. She plays Vera. Yes. Um, but in Saving Grace, she's growing marijuana. Yes. And so the sisters in the post office are high as kites eating Frosted Flakes. And they've got those glasses that have like slinky eyes on slinky them. Eyes but on in them. my head, it was the same thing. <laughs> I was like, those two are going to put on slinky eyes a little bit later? No, no. So, they are brooch-wearing, multi-layered, clothes-wearing, uptight sisters. Yes. Who so, support Floyd. They do. Support Lloyd a lot. So, so speaking of Lloyd, as soon as I saw him, the first time I saw this episode, I was like, Star Wars. Yes. Like, immediately, I was like... Imperial officer. He is the imperial officer who let the the transport in even though it had an old code i knew exactly and what was that transport that was the one that had everybody in it yeah he so he let the good guys into the death star yes <laughs> like no small mistake oh, that's wow. a, a major mistake that he's done <laughs> so lloyd kirby is played by kenneth coley yeah and he was not only in one star wars he was in two star wars and according to imdb i couldn't verify this Absolutely. But according to IMDb, he's the only uh, actor to play two Imperial officers, to play an Imperial officer in two movies. Oh, I'm going to have to look that up. I'll have to watch them again. But it was it was tough to verify because I would have had to compare the complete cast of both of all the movies. And that's a long list of people that is. But other than extras in the background, he's in. uh, Yeah, he plays the same character. Oh, that's cool. Anybody else he plays that's interesting that you know about? Not on my list. Oh, you missed something. Mm. Because I I caught it when I looked him up. Uh, He's in Life of Brian. Oh, yeah. Do you remember who he plays in Life of Brian? No. He plays Jesus Christ. He does? Yes. Oh, that's awesome. So he is also the only person, as far as I know, who played Jesus Christ and an Imperial General. Yeah, there can't be a lot of crossovers there. <laughs> no. So Lloyd goes out to the field with Beatrice. He's eager to get some some photographs of the crop circles, but he's gonna be he's gonna be stopped. And it he gets stopped. And Sir Harry, first of all, is horrible to his wife. Sir Harry's horrible to everybody. And then Lloyd just wants to take some pictures, and there's this I love this part where Barnaby looks at Troy and just Tut tuts like like no go stop no, him no, no, go stop him and Troy's off to stop him and but luckily there's a reading club because he gives him a book <laughs> Lloyd is fantastically confident in his beliefs and he bears criticism like water off a duck yeah does not let it bother him 
And even though Barnaby is not buying the line about the UFO, clearly he's not a believer, Lloyd still hands him his book, Close Encounters of the Midsummer Kind. I want one of these. So do I. Desperately (laughs) want this book. And it must be good reading because within an hour, Barnaby has it all read, marked up, post-it note, highlighted, everything. Absolutely. And there are many pages in this book that are real pages. Yeah. It's it's awesome. They print it like, it's not like, sometimes they do books and they just put like a cover over it. right? Right. Makes sense. Yeah. No, no. This is a book that got printed. Somehow, somebody. Somewhere this book exists. Exists. <laughs> Desperately want this book. <laughs> then we go from there to our first awesome morgue scene. Yes. We, we don't want to go on too much about the fact that these actors are such great corpse actors, but it really is above and beyond any expectation of an so, actor. <laughs> so two things, two things here. One, he is dead still, yes. full body naked for 39 seconds. Mouth like, open, no breathing, no twitching, nothing. no eye crinkling, nothing. Second of all, they clearly lit his body so that his ass hair would be visible. <laughs> because- Not just his ass hair. But the fine scratches from the wheat on his skin. I feel kind of bad for him. He's got abrasions. It's like this halo of fine, downy ass hair across (laughs) his ass. His hands are all scorched. His head's been shaved. And he's got puncture wounds on his lower back. I don't know if I could even open my mouth for 39 seconds. Especially kind of face down. Oh, it just would be so st- difficult. He does a great job. We meet Michael Raycroft, who is... Super cor- coroner. Super coroner. He's not just a coroner. He's, he's also a, an engineer. An engineer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't need George. No. Not when we got this guy. And we also see the return of Stupid Troy. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he was out making the crop circle and struck by lightning. Really, Troy? Barnaby it, doesn't even bother to say, naked? Did it blow his clothes <laughs> yeah. off? Did he shave his own head beforehand? What about the marks on his back? It's just like, mm, no, that's not how it happened. Meanwhile, Beatrice is pissed. Jeez. She has every right to be. I agree. We find out later that her family is not gentry. It's almost an arranged marriage between her and Harry. They have money, but not title. Once they have the kid, once they have Lucy, their marriage kind of just falls apart. They go their separate ways, but can stay married and living together. But she clearly is eager to defend Lloyd against Harry because she cares about Lloyd. She says Lloyd has more humanity in his little finger than Harry does in his entire body. And they have some moments later on that are really nice. Yeah. I think they do a very good job of showing Beatrice and Lloyd as being the kind of people who have been friends since they were little and have been through a lot together. Yeah, there may have been a little bit of romance between them, but they've kind of matured past that and they just genuinely care about one another. But but I think near the end, that flame gets rekindled. At least on Lloyd's part. Certainly. Because he's in the halcyon days of the house again. After the kerfluffle at the manor, Barnaby and Troy go to talk to Lloyd. And as they go in, Troy says something that's kind of interesting. He says he's worried that they've been shunted off onto a siding by this UFO stuff. Like it's a red herring? Yeah, it's a, it's a railway term. Of course she picked that up. Which uh, <laughs> means that when you have two, on a major track, if you have two trains that are coming together, there's only one track. So what they have what is called a siding, which one train can go off onto that siding and then come back onto the main track. That's kind of a sophisticated comment for Troy. It is, and it's called shunting when you go onto the siding. So I thought I would fill people in as to what that is. This is also where we see the Encounters of the Midsummer Kind book whipped out again, and Barnaby's got it all flagged up and highlighted and pages folded, and yes, so he's they, done his homework. They, they take uh, Lloyd down to the cop shop, and they basically interrogate him over moving the body, because they're pretty convinced that he's moved the body. And they have a look in this book, because there's a very similar case of Elmore Brooks, with a picture of Elmore Brooks. I don't know who that picture is, but we see more of Elmore Bro- Brooks on page 56. <laughs> we see his big 
big old naked butt. And this is supposed to be an American case, right? Yes, it is supposed to be an American case. He is, there's quite a bit of stuff in the pages. It's super interesting. It's hard to read. It's hard to see exactly what's there. And they never show full pages or anything like that. But they do show uh, his big old butt, which is figure number 56. (laughs) And Lloyd has an explanation for everything that is going on right now because it's all references to the book, right? So the yeah. body in the book also had puncture marks, also had its head shaved. It and he's like, well, fun. that's to take spinal, you know, fluid and that's to do DNA analysis, even though you can't do DNA analysis on hair that doesn't have a root. Exactly. So that's not going to work. Uh, but he couldn't have moved the body because he was at the Roxy uh, with Lady Chapman watching War of the Worlds, yep. which is kind of cool. So he's got an alibi. Yeah. But he has a conveniently dated flyer that he can give Barnaby because it happens that just that same evening, he's having a meeting. He is. What do you know? What, what a coincidence. You know? And uh, he's going to have a talk at the Village Hall tonight, and he'd love Barnaby to come. But they have a visitor who has come to see Lloyd, but none other than Sir Christian Aubrey. Right. Who we haven't seen since uh, he was dueling. Yes, and we didn't as even a young know man. it was him at, at this point in time. Sir Christian Aubrey is played by Alec McCowan, who's a, a well-seasoned actor by this time. He d- he's done a lot of, he had done a lot of theater, a lot of stage work. But he was in Frenzy in yes. 1972, which is an Alfred Hitchcock movie. He plays the uh, detective sergeant, no, the detective inspector in Frenzy who eventually comes around at the end of the movie to that the innocent man is innocent. Yeah. He's also Q in Never Say Never Again. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So that's excellent. And he has bailed Lloyd out before when he used to be basically the like an ambassador in Burma. Yeah, they met in Rangoon, Rangoon 20 years ago. And uh, Lloyd was an easy target for heroin, heroin smugglers. And he was actually sentenced to death, but Christian Aubrey got him off. Yeah, we get this view of, of Lloyd as this happy-go-lucky victim, you know, that he's an easy target, an easy mark to make fun of. And Christian's a good guy. And we don't really see anything different about that. No, he's no. still that guy. And... We're introduced to Christian as a good guy. And then we've got Harry going to the health center. The Newton Lane Health Center. Now, I watched all three health center epi- uh, interludes to see who was in the waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because not only do they have Sally as a receptionist. Which, she, she is not appropriate for a receptionist. No. And is this a doctor's office or is this like an old age home? Because there's a lot of older people in well, here. Well, old people go to the doctor more than younger people. I guess. Right? But Harry's there. And he wants a home to visit. To set up a rendezvous. A home visit. With Sally. For the sex. This scene reminded me of something I've always wondered about these village doctor's offices and British shows. They often show their medical records being in these kind of little slipped in file folders that they almost look like a larger version of the envelope that used to be in the back of a library card. They've yes. got like slots on the outside to write on or like an inner office, inner office envelope. Yes. But they're like maybe four by six. Yeah, they're weird. Like, whose medical records fit in a four by six? I, Tiny. I, you know, drank too much tea and had appendicitis. Are they all on microfish or something? Yes. <laughs> I still don't understand why he goes in person to arrange a home visit. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I know the home visit isn't really a home visit, but he's saying that so the people in the lobby don't he's know what he's actually a huge arranging. When he could just call her, he could just call and say, "Hey, can you come by at four o'clock?" Yeah, you know, let's meet up. I don't know why he does that in person, but oh well. Tom's gonna drag Joyce to the lecture. She's so disappointed. She's like, "I guess we're not going out for our anniversary." He's like, "That's not until later this week." Aha, so you know about my anniversary. And then Mark goes on a 20-minute binge about trying to figure out what day their anniversary is. (laughs) And I could not figure it out. You're such a nerd. All we know is their anniversary is Friday. Happy anniversary, Tom and and Joyce. Joyce. Well, you couldn't look closely at the flyer to see if there was a date on it? No, there was no date on anything. I Um. looked everywhere. (laughs) They're the going... problem was, I actually know what day it is today, but I don't know how many days it is between now and Friday. Because they never say, 
oh, now it's our anniversary. Yeah. So today is Tuesday and our anniversary is Friday or, or anything like that. It, yeah. I have a range of seven days it could be. Well, so we know when their anniversary week is. Yes. <laughs> That's okay. I think their anniversary is mentioned in a different episode. Nerd. So we can come back to it. Meanwhile, Steve and Lucy are rowing over pants. Whatever. He's such a jerk. Steve is a dick about ironing. I'm sorry. He is. She didn't do my ironing perfect. <laughs> Steve Ramsey is played by Patrick Bellotti. He was in the Shakespeare and Hathaway episode that we watched last night, which is also a, a good show on Acorn if you like light mysteries. Brit Box. Brit Box. Sorry, not Acorn. He's in that movie, The Windmill. Do you remember watching that movie? It's a horror movie. Oh, Jesus, yes. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. That was a woo. That's quite the movie. Yeah. Um, but the most interesting fact I could find about, about Patrick Bellotti is that his dad was Colonel Gaddafi's wife's gynecologist. <laughs> what? Yes. <laughs> He grew so, up in the Middle East. So he grew up in Libya? Yeah, Patrick okay. Bellotti did. And his dad was a gynecologist. Okay. And one of his patients was Colonel Gaddafi's wife. Wow. That's like six degrees of separation. I never thought I'd get to. <laughs> I told you I had a crazy fact. Absolutely. That's amazing. I had to confirm it in a couple of places. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm not buying. I don't know. That's really weird. But, but his dad was a very well-known man all by himself. So oh, it's true. Cool. Yeah. So the next heading in my notes is probably one of my favorite ones. Certainly my favorite one for this entire episode. One of my favorite ones for our entire podcast, which is Teenage Crop Circle Sex Party. (laughs) You're so strange. And this is a whole series of scenes, too, that are clearly shot at day, but have been altered to look like they're at night. Yes. So So it's, it's weird. Teenager A, the... Let's, teenager M, the male, mm. and Teenager F, the female, are never named. No. They're not in the credits. No, they even get, though they speak. They have lots of speaking parts, mm-hmm. and he gets topless. Mm-hmm. The, it, it's just an episode in which whoever was taking notes for the credits dropped the ball. And she touches a dead hand. She does. And screams. She screams and screams and screams, and this is Eddie Field. Get it? He's in a field. I get it. And his uh-huh. name... Is any field. But then we go back to the meeting. This is Lloyd preaching to the choir. Absolutely. Especially the two old ladies from the the, the, the post, post office. office. They're like, yeah, <laughs> go get them, Lloyd. We love you, Lloyd. Oh, Lloyd. And Sir Harry only goes to these things to be upset. To call him a nutter. Yep. It's, it, and Lloyd's got his necklace on and his yep. shirt's kind of unbuttoned. Yep. And he Lady is like, Beatrice is there. he is in his groove. These are his people. And he has slides. Yeah. Which she has to control for him. Speaking of Sir Harry, just a quick note. He's played by John Woodvine, who's also in the Oblong Murders. Yeah. Later on. Okay. But he was in two very important movies okay. as a younger man. What was he in? He was in The Devils. Oh, and ni- I didn't know he was in The Devils. In 1971, starring Oliver Reed. If you've never seen The Devils, brace yourself. It's it a, is. Oliver Reed is a, as a priest sent to control everything, and he joins in instead. It's very weird. So this movie is directed by Ken Russell. Yeah. Who is one of my favorite directors. It is. So Ken Russell directed this movie, which made me fall in love with Oliver Reed. I, I remember, don't know what that means about you. I remember we watched it as teenagers and we're like, Oliver Reed is the greatest human being who ever lived. He's also drunk. Oh, he's for so the drunk. Entire, the entire movie. Entire movie. As the the actor is drunk. Absolutely. Uh, he also directed Tommy. <laughs> he directed Lair of the White Worm. He is. Just... What are movies that Sarah won't watch for five hundred? <laughs> he's just the strangest dude, and I love him. He also plays Dr. Hirsch in American Werewolf in London. He is the doctor. That's right. He's the doctor in American Werewolf in London. Yeah, John Woodvine is. Absolutely. And he's awesome in that movie. Oh, yeah, he is. But he, he, even in The Devils, he plays a jerk. Well, of like, course he does. He's an well, aristocratic he's a nice guy in the American Werewolf in okay. London. He's okay. Yeah, yeah, and he he's just so good at being an asshole. He this in this role in Midsummer is a perfect example. And he asks Tom to go for a scotch, but he can't. No, I, I don't think he wants to. No, I don't think he wants he's to. He's like, no, no, I just want to interview you for five minutes. 
because they have to go find this other body. Yeah. And Troy's driving. So, of course, Joyce gets ditched, you know, and then they end up in a ditch. I think (laughs) that every time that Troy drives, especially at night, it should play Yakety Sax. (laughs) Well, first of all, he thinks that a combine harvester is a UFO. And he Ah! freaks out. He... The actor looks scared. He looks panicked. Yeah. He does. He and does then Tom really gets out job. and he walks towards the lights and it's like close encounters of the third kind. And he's like, you know, what am I going to tell your wife? And yeah. Everything. <laughs> that I so. talked to a farmer. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then once they realize it's combine harvester, Troy wrecks the car. <laughs> well, he tries to back up to get out of the way and goes into a ditch. Of course. Right after that is my favorite shot of the whole episode, which is a steady cam shot of the police, including Troy and Barnaby and a couple of uniformed officers walking through the wheat towards the crop circle. It's a very cinematic It's extremely shot, cinematic. Which is strange for Midsummer. It is. It's, it is jarring and yet beautiful. It's, it's almost as if the camera guy said... I could do something really beautiful here, so I'm just going to do it. Yes. And the lighting guy said, well, it's daytime, and it's supposed to be night, so I don't have to do anything. (laughs) So they find Eddie Field in the field, in the crop circle. He's nakedy naked. With the puncture marks and the burnt hands and and the shaved head. Flip him over and look at his junk and basically point. (laughs) And so this is the murder that is unsolved it is i mean we kind of know how he died but it's never officially pointed out no he's kind of forgotten and i was going to cover this at the end of the episode Mm. that, that what like i have a theory about what happened based on two pieces of evidence but it's never confirmed no what happens there well Oh, I'm going to ruin it, right? So it, we're fairly sure that he's electrocuted in Dave Rippert's foundry. Yes. Right? Isn't it convenient that two men get electrocuted in two different ways in the same place and both have black hands? Yes. What I don't understand is he has the same haircutting mark and the same marks on his back, but I don't think that was ever released to anybody. That information... So if it was Dave Rippert who did this, he had Lloyd's book and did the same thing that Lloyd did? Or inside information from the cop shop, or it had made the newspaper and leaked, or something. I gotta think Sally may have a few friends in the cop shop. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Troy would tell her anything she wanted to know. friends everywhere. Yeah. Then we have Sir Harry and his love nest. Now... We later learn that this is Lloyd's boyhood bedroom, which is strange enough. It's weird that it's even Lloyd's childhood home. It's weirder that it's his bedroom. It's even weirder that it's still decorated like it's his bedroom. Like, uh, I have a a sort of list of the stuff in here, hand-drawn things, uh, flying saucers, and a collection of fantastic 50s lunchboxes. To which I'm like, where are they? <laughs> and why wouldn't Lloyd have taken those when they moved out of the house? I would have thought. Like, wh- who, who leaves the childhood bedroom pristinely in the same exact situation when they move out of a house? I don't, I don't get it. Well, And this is the scene where Harry says that really yucky thing. Oh. He, wants to, he wants to get it on with Sally and she's not in the mood. And he says... Oh, come on. Just a little touch for your Uncle Harry. Like, yeah. yeah. So he shows up late and Sally's having none of it. Mm -mm. No sexy sex for you. (laughs) And they talk about Stephen and Sir Harry's like, I don't want you to see Stephen anymore. Which is like. Ring, ring. It's pot calling kettle. Like (laughs) Sally has problems. Okay. She's a thief Mm -hmm. and a liar. Mm -hmm. But who. Or when she has activity with is all up to her. Two of them are married, though. Well, that is true. Though, of the Midsummer episodes, she may be the character who acknowledged who is acknowledged to sleep with more people in the same episode than any other character. She sleeps with three people at the very least. In yeah, this and sometimes in the same day. And yeah, well, you know, she's a goer. Yes, absolutely. She's. Imagine if we had Orlando Bloom and her in the same episode. (laughs) 
they would get along with <laughs> like a house on fire. They'd hate each other. <laughs> We find out that Fields had engineering mineral oil and silver oxide on him in addition to his head being shaved, the puncture wounds, the burnt hands, the nakedness, the crop circle. And they figure out who he is. These and he's been out of prison for like a month. Yep, yeah, and that he's like a burglary guy. Yeah, and there was a burglary in Badger's Drift the night before. By the beaches. Who Who is there to burgle from in Badger's Drift now? I don't now? know if there's anybody left alive in Badger's Drift. <laughs> Every time there's an episode there, more people get killed. Killed, killed, killed. I don't know. Okay, so... But I, whoever it was, they had a very nice painting of a pig. They did. Mm. I'm Steven, mm. and I don't like my wife. I don't like her parents. I sure like their money. They give me this crappy truck to drive around in with, with hay, hay in, in the, the back, back of yeah. it. So where am I going to go to party? Costin. Co- Co- Costin? The nightlights of there's, Costin. The, there's nightclubs in Costin? It's did, like Vegas. Did he take the truck there? <laughs> yeah. Because he's going to smell like hay at the nightclub. He drove his jalopy to the nightclubs. Hey, ladies. <laughs> so then, to kind of up the ante of creepy men in this episode, she's like in the middle of an argument with him. And Lucy he, is. Yeah. Lucy. And, she, and he's like... You love what Stevie does to you. Okay, <sighs> if you have to refer to yourself in the third person, that's With a bad. Y on the end. But then to sort of infantile your name in, into, like, Marky. Oh, uh, no. No. No, 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 no. No. Troy and Barnaby check out the foundry and find just bitches, bunches of evidence all over the place. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're supposed to just guess that Dave found... Eddie Fields dead there, kind of missed the fact that there was still some silver that hadn't been melted down yet, was more worried about getting the body out of there and putting it somewhere. So are we supposed to believe that Dave Rippert made the crop circle that Eddie's found in? Yeah, I don't know who made that crop circle either. Because it's a, it's a separate crop circle. It's a yeah. completely different pattern. But who So made in that? a night, Dave found Eddie, moved him to the field had the insider information about the body and yes. what it state it should be in, made a crop circle that is really cool looking. Yes. And then put a body in it. And I'm going to add on to that, had sex with Sally. Yeah. that He's busy. And probably during the day. Yeah. Because when the teen sex party is happening, Eddie's already there, and that's during the meeting at the town hall, which happens in the evening. The day after. And Eddie's already there. It's all screwed up. So Dave was super busy that night, I guess. Eddie, the whole Eddie thing is just a big screw up. Which I think is kind of why the writers went, "Mm, let's just uh, not deal with that. Well, it's... There's a second body. Anyway. What has been said by Brian Trume is that it was left out in editing, which I understand that. Well, yeah, because there must have been a scene when they went, did you know that Dave Rippert is a time traveler now? (laughs) And a mathematical genius who can one-handedly create a giant crop circle and put a dead body in it yep. all in an afternoon with nobody noticing? All before a teen crop circle sex party. Yeah, I would edit that scene out too. I, I would agree. <laughs> Troy goes off to Dave's house and Dave knows nothing. He was in Oxford and he has a big old hangover. Don't leave me. Leave me alone and you can't come in. Yeah, initially I was sort of confused by what even led them to Dave Rippert, but it's because Eddie Fields was known to work for Dave. Yeah. And Dave had the foundry, so even though he lost the foundry, he doesn't own it anymore, they think, well, he's probably involved because he was a thief too, right? Yeah. Yeah, and and he does not know how to not seem suspicious. He doesn't, (laughs) but he's not a very good criminal, and I'm going to tell you why. Oh, gosh, no. I'm going to tell you why they're not very good criminals. So Troy leaves, right? Mm -hmm. Presumably to go get a warrant or to talk to Barnaby. Right. Right? And then here's what happens. And this is behind the scenes. Dave and Sally get dressed because Sally's not dressed. And then they take all the boxes that are overflowing with silver treasure. Yeah. Not closed, hiding it at all. Put them in Sally's car. In the daylight. Yeah. And drive to Sally's flat, which is above, above the, doctor's, the office. doctor's office. They do pull, 
pull into an alley beside the doctor's office. Which just makes least. it easier for the two ladies who own the post office to see them doing it. That in the daylight, they didn't take all the stuff upstairs. Including putting the pig picture on top of the car. Yeah. In full view. They just are the worst criminals of all They're time. They're really dumb. Really dumb. Tom talks to Beatrice in a nice little scene where she gives a bunch of exposition. Yeah, about their childhood, the fact that they were born on the same day and they fell in love and then her dad kind of forced her to marry Harry and sent Lloyd away. And it's a tragic situation, And it's but it's nice that they've come back together as friends now later in life. Unfortunately, and he's going to die in about five minutes. Lloyd is well-traveled. Yeah, he's been around. Yep. He's a worldly dude. So after uh, moving their ill-gotten booty... <laughs> Right. (laughs) Into Sally's apartment. Sally's apartment. Dave goes, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do now. What are you going to do, Sally? And she goes, oh, I'm going to go have sex with Steven again. In in the the field. field. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. (laughs) (laughs) And we get killer cam in the wheat. So somebody's watching them, which is creepy. It's Harry. Harry's creepy. And Stephen, after having sex with Sally, says goodbye. She gets in her little Volkswagen. Stephen gets in his little blue truck and zap. This is pretty good special effects. They got some smoke going on. They got some post-production sparks going on. But poor Patrick Bellotti had to sit gripping a steering wheel made of rubber that yes. wouldn't have electrocuted him, at least coated in rubber, and go, la, 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 la. Yeah, his the, teeth must have been so sore. <laughs> the sound he makes, the sound he makes, yeah, is awesome. <laughs> There's even sparks coming off the rubber tires. Yes, there's lots of sparks. And who finds the body but Lloyd? Oh, yeah. But, you know, he did die because Harry basically hooks him up to the mains, right? Yes. <laughs> like, there's a, a power line right there. It's not as if you plugged him into the wall. No. It's like full voltage. So maybe that would go through vinyl coating on a steering wheel. It's a I cheap truck. Who knows? I kept thinking, boy... Steven stinks already, but now he really smells. Yeah. <laughs> He's just blackened. Because they would smell that before they even got anywhere <sighs> near the car. They would at least smell the burning. But Lloyd has his head on his shoulders here and recognizes that this is not alien in- intervention. Yeah. This is human beings doing this. He's got a walking tour with him and he tells them to stay back and he sees the body Again, in the truck. I like Lloyd. Lloyd he's not a bad right person. Things. No, he's not a bad person. He he makes one mistake because he's excited and he wants people to believe. But now, other than I'm that, I'm going to say he makes two mistakes because he clearly sees a dead body in this car that is smoking basically. Right? Mhm. And then he touches the car. Now, I realize the car is unconnected to the mains at this point and dragged off into another area. But he doesn't know that. But he doesn't know that. <laughs> yeah, he, he could have easily gotten fried there, right? Meanwhile, at the doctor's office, the guy in the yellow shirt and the dark coat in the wheelchair is still there. <laughs> in the saddest waiting room ever. In so the now he's back looking for sexy sex again. Yeah. But when Lloyd talks to Barnaby, they talk about crop circles being a modern thing. And Lloyd says, no, actually, crop circles can be traced back all the way to 1670. Which we didn't believe. I wrote a note. I'm like, ah, really? Come on. But then Google came to our rescue. And we found out that the earliest crop circle is linked to this pamphlet. In Hertfordshire in 1678. And we found out that it was from this pamphlet called The Mowing Devil or the Strange News Out of Hertfordshire, published in 1678. And I'll put the picture of this pamphlet in the show notes. (laughs) This looks like a guy doing a crop circle. (laughs) Now, crop circle experts say that this isn't actually the first crop circle because the wheat was cut instead of bent as in modern crop circles. We, we, I know. The devil is impatient. He just cuts the shit. He doesn't bend it. I know that we're midsummer nerds, but we're not crop circle nerds. All I know is that mowing devil seems to be doing a good job, and he can come by our house anytime. He does. It's very circular. It's a very good job. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's quite the woodcut. I'm all right with that. Back at the crime scene, 
we Lloyd says it has nothing to do with aliens, and there's a report from the ladies at the post office about Sally and Dave Rippert. They're really dumb criminals who move stuff in the middle of the day, and I have five shirts on and a brooch. And Troy is like, <laughs> I hear she's a bit of a goer. A bit of a goer? <laughs> That won't stop him from like uh, 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 wiggling his eyebrows and everything else at her later. This woman is on the World Cup team for the UK of goers. <laughs> <laughs> so Rippert's place is clean and Troy is going to have a word with Sally. And then they, um, they're they looking, the, the crime scene team is looking at the truck, kind of figure out how it happened. And what do you know? Michael Rycroft, the world's handiest coroner, is also an engineer and can Absolutely. completely explain how he was electrocuted in his own truck. Not only am I a doctor, I'm an engineer. Yes. <laughs> He's so handy. And they find a magazine from Lloyd Kirby's place that has a truck with an ex- electrocution story just like this. So again, Lloyd is connected to this. So does that mean that Harry has been reading Lloyd's book? Well, okay. There is a giant poster of this truck in Lloyd's shop. So it's not exactly like he was reading the book. He wouldn't. Well, Harry's not going to hang out in Lloyd's shop. I don't know. But, you know, he's probably been to enough of the town meetings and seen enough of the slides before he screams nutter and walks out that maybe he's seen that picture before. Maybe. (laughs) And he does move the truck to be closer to the field where the crop circles are to make it look like it's associated. So Barnaby goes down to the the post office, not the toast office, the post office, to see the old deers and find out what's going on. They have a magical door lock. It is a magical door lock. She says, I'm going to lock the door. And she walks across the room and switches the sign from open to close. And suddenly the door is locked. Apparently. That's the equivalent of locking the door. I guess. Another local man electrocuted. Stephen Ramsey is in in the paper. It's just kind of nutsy bobo at this point that we have three dead bodies already in this episode. All dealing with electrocution yeah and we still we still don't know why like but why do we have this dueling scene at the beginning and why is sir christian aubrey important when he comes to not bail out lloyd and finally we start to see those two stories come together it takes a little while because christian goes to see his wife Mm -hmm. isabel yeah and she is in the world's cheapest wheelchair but she's at a very nice home. She is, but they need to spend a little bit more ta- money on their wheelchairs. But she wants to go home for a little while, so he takes her home. And my gosh, their house is so beautiful. So that actress's name is what? Her name is Ursula Howells. And she looks like an Ursula. Oh, I don't think so. I do, which is a good thing. Ursula Howells was in an absolutely fantastic movie. Okay. Like, just assume that she was in The Bill, Coronation Street, Doctors, all whatever, those all those shows. Yeah. yeah, 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 yada, yada. I don't even talk about that. EastEnders. I look for what is interesting. Yes. And the interesting thing. The devil. <clears throat> is that she was in a movie around the same time. It was in 1970 called Girly. Girly. Okay. Okay. The extended title is Mumsy, Nanny, Sunny, and Girly. Okay. She plays Mumsy. Okay. This is a mother and her daughter and her son and their nanny who kill people. Yeah. They, Girly is this little hot to trot teenager. She lures men into their house and they kill them in torturous, crazy ways. And she's the matriarch of the family, Mumsy. Yeah, I've seen this. <laughs> it is weird. It's like a, a non-hammer horror film made in the same time as the hammer horror films. Wow. But it's just funny to see this this little refined woman, Lady Isabel. She's yes, so beautiful. She is beautiful. And then to see her in this younger role where she's dressed in red from head to toe and has this evil diabolical look on her <laughs> face. Yeah, you know, like, kill him, kill him, well, you know. Course, it's really strange. I'll put information about that particular film and hopefully a picture of her in the show notes. Oh, I found a great picture. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. <laughs> but there, Christian and Isabel are in their house, a lifetime of love. It's wonderful. It, see, it's all tainted for me. It's all tainted because the only reason they're sitting there together is because he cut Peter on the face. Yeah. 
And she couldn't make a decision. Not because she always loved him and and no one else, but because he won. I'll tell you who can make a decision, though. The parish council. Yo, yeah. Because the parish council at some point in time said, hey, we need a bench out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> And they it's said it next should be to that concrete. transformer box. It should be near that transformer box so that when there's a crime scene in 10 years and Barnaby, if he needs a place to sit down, it's there. Yeah. What is that bench doing out there? <laughs> I don't know. It's really weird. Barnaby figures out that the truck was pulled away from the transformer, figures the whole thing out. Yeah, because the transformer has a padlock that's broken. And in- meanwhile, Troy is going to go interview Sally. In the worst dress Ever. It looks like a yarn dress, but is it? it's printed, and then the boob part is printed <laughs> another way, which accentuates and worsens the boob part. <laughs> and don't forget the collar necklace thing with the bead oh, bits hanging it's down. It's just horrid. Well, hey, it's what Troy likes, though. Yes, he does indeed. He's, boy, he's into it. He's absolutely all over her visually. And even though the vicar and the lady from the council are trying to run an organized meeting, Lloyd takes it over. Of course he does. But in that meeting is a young Trent Reznor, too. <laughs> yes. This kid looks like Trent Reznor. Who, if you don't know, is the lead singer of a band called Nine Inch Nails. And he looks completely out of place. Yeah, he does. Meeting. He's like... Hey, I'm the emo punk guy of this little village, and I'm going to come to this town meeting. Like, what teenager goes to the town meeting? Maybe he's into UFO, so he's going to go. I don't know. The priest is on about, uh, the the vicar is on about Prince of Darkness, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it might be kind of good. That's true. And this this scene marks a point. After which, every time we see Lloyd, he will have fewer buttons of his shirt button. It's just going down. I don't it's know going why. Down, man. But he's got more buttons unbuttoned now. And the next time we see him, it will be one one fewer button buttoned, and then and then he dies. So. And guess what? It's a it's a village meeting in the village hall, and Sir Harry's there. So stompy, stompy, stompy. Yeah, and the post office sisters are there with all of their shirts. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not exactly sure why 100%, but they go off to see Christian. Yeah, I'm not really sure either. I don't really know what the connection is. And when they get there, they find all these cool electric gadgets because his dad was a science teacher. Mm-hmm. Okay, if his dad was a science teacher, how did he afford to go to Oxford? Well, remember, university at that point... Could have been publicly funded. But still, how did he get all this money for the house that he lives in now? He's sir. But so how he must did have he done do some, that? He must have. He must uh, have done something. I guess. I think they mentioned what he, what he's known for. Like what, how he made his money. But um, I can't remember right now. Troy says he's a local bigwig. That's yeah, all. Yeah, he's just a bigwig. Peter's heart was poisoned. Luckily, he has a distillery in Scotland to make him feel better. Yeah. <laughs> he's doing just fine. Tom gets to play with the Wimshurst machine. Makes little sparks. Do you think he'd come and see me? Isabel wants Peter to come and see her. One last time. Never mind that he's been trying to kill her husband for years. So now, back into... Another sex scene in Lloyd's bedroom. <laughs> well, and this real. one is worse because Sally is not in the mood again. I don't think she's ever in the mood with, well. And Sir Harry is like, maybe I killed him and maybe I didn't. And then suddenly she gets all turned on by it. Because he says she can leave some stuff in the house. Like. Because she's got some stuff from her gran. Uh, like, you know I what it is. Understand. You know what? I know what it is. Okay. She. They don't say it, <clears throat> but she's thinking, can I leave my booty in your house? And he says, yes, speaking of booty. Oh, okay. There you go. There. <laughs> the double entendre was there. It's a subliminal double entendre. <laughs> and you you just missed it. I'm sorry. You oh, missed okay. it. That's why. And then he says again, come here to Uncle Harry. Oh, it's like, just, oh. It wasn't gross the first time. They got to do it again. On the way out. Of Sir Christian's house, they see a butane gas burner. Yeah, because Lloyd's left his duffel bag of tools right inside the door, and they kick it. So what was Lloyd fixing there? Well, obviously he was making the crop circle. 
with his torch. Yeah, that's making the burn marks. Making the burn mark. And then he's like, "Well, let me leave this bag at Christian's house." I guess Lloyd's kind of forgetful. So, so, so Lloyd. So we know that the first body died at Christian's house. So Lloyd comes over and takes the body, goes out, makes the crop circle, burns the marks, put the body in it, and then goes back to back to Christian's house with his bag and guess, leaves it there. I guess that's what he does. Oh, that's very complex. Well, it's not Krypton God, gra- gas from Zog. No. Tom and Troy get to break into Aubrey's house. This is one of the best scenes of Midsummer. So there's a funeral in the meantime for Stephen, which means nothing at all. Right. Unimportant. Nobody liked him. Anyway. So Barnaby and Troy go back into the house when Sir Aubrey isn't there. Right. And wow, it gets fun. Because <laughs> Troy, first of all, we've just, got special effects. It's the next day and Troy has changed his tie, but not his shirt. Yeah. And he breaks in with a card and the door slams and then everything is electric. Right. There's a light that goes boop, 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 boop. And the like, you know, the room's powered up. Yes, the and whole the whole thing is wired. Even the plastic telephone is electrified. Okay, so the doors I'll give you, the windows I'll give you. Okay, but the telephone with that much juice going through it, the wire would go on fire and the phone would melt. Yeah, it yeah. just would. I just don't get it as an alarm system. <laughs> I just don't understand because it traps people in the house. But it's not going to deter anybody from breaking into the house. It just means that once they break in, you get to keep them. Awesome. Why not stop them from getting in in the first place? It's just, it's so much effort for an alarm system that is absolutely ineffective. Sir Aubrey's at the hospital with his wife. And so they basically are there overnight until the next morning. (laughs) Yeah, so they both fall asleep in their chairs, right? When our favorite dude shows up. (laughs) Bin man. Bin man. <laughs> so they try to get the bin man's attention. But he's bopping with his headphones on. He's bopping with, and Troy is like, bin man, bin man. <laughs> There's a song there. There is a song there. Mm. Sally's moving the stuff. Oh, she's so stupid. And Sir Aubrey comes home and holy gadgets, Batman, because he opens up the thing like Batman does. And his super secret alarm code to turn the alarm off is 3A. Mm-hmm. And he gets a sword from the hallway because everybody keeps a sword in their umbrella stand in the hallway. Now let's put this in some context. Christian has had assassins come after him for the last 20 years or something, 40 yes. years, right? So yeah, he keeps a sword in the umbrella stand just in case. But why he would electrify the inside of his house to keep people yeah. in, I don't know. I don't know. So he goes in and he finds them and he turns the system off. And he says that he's never killed, it's never killed anybody but one, basically. Yeah. And Troy and Tom says he needs to come down the, to the station and he says, do you want to come down to the station to, to talk about this? And Sir Aubrey has a great line here, well delivered, where he goes, I don't really, but I better say yes. <laughs> well, he wants to go be with his wife. Yes. Right? So he rearms the uh, system with 12A. Even though they tell him not to. Yes. I don't know. I'm just trying to make sense of it. Maybe it's alarmed the way it is because he knows Peter's going to send assassins after him and he wants to catch them. Maybe. Those are not the only doors in the house. No. It's a fun idea, poorly executed. Yeah, but it's it's still fun. It's, it's still fun worth to it. see them. It's still <laughs> totally fine. I'm okay with it. Even yeah. though it doesn't make sense, I'm totally okay with it. Back at the Ufology Center, Lady Beatrice. Le- Lady Beatrice and Lloyd have a nice little moment. Yeah. Where they talk about how her husband probably married Steve. M- murdered. Probably murdered Steve. And he admits to making the crop circle and putting the body in it, and he feels really bad. And the guy had broken into Christians, and he owed Christian, so he did the things. And she says, we got to straighten this out. Wait for me at the cottage. I'll meet you there in an hour. The cottage where we used to have sex? I don't think they ever did. Oh, I think they did. 
I think they loved each other, but I don't think they did. But he certainly kind of struts towards the cottage with his shirt even more unbuttoned, as if he's expecting to. And he comes up and finds Sally in bed. Lounging with her stolen booty. Yes. And a very interesting double cola poster. In the hallway. Yes. Yeah. I found it. I found the exact poster that's in the hallway. It's very interesting. That cola is an American cola. I don't know why that poster is there. It was never sold in Britain. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Well, then Dave throws him down the stairs. Uh, while her tits are hanging out. Yeah, pretty much. What's new, though? Exactly. And then we have Christian back at the cop shop, and we finally find out that he and Peter had this duel, and... He won Isabel in the duel. And since then, Peter's not forgiven him, has been sending assassins after him since, and that Stokes was, was one, one of, of those, those assassins, yeah. right? A very bad one. Yes, exactly. Who somehow got way more shocked by the doorknobs than Tom I can only think Troy he did. grabbed onto the doorknob and couldn't let go. Maybe, but w- both of his hands were black. I guess. So did he grab it with both hands? I guess. And we get a flashback to the grumpiest picnic ever. I'll kiss you on the cheek. I'll kiss you on the cheek. Wouldn't it be nice if you fought over me to the death? And this is going to taint the rest of our lives? Yay. Sorry, guys. We're grumpy about Isabel. So they find out that Lloyd's dead. Yep, he's in a crop circle. And, and then Troy points at his butt. He's naked, and Troy <laughs> points at his butt. And Lloyd, if Lloyd was the only d- naked old guy in this episode, he would be winning dead the body. best best corpse. Yeah, but he, he's got nothing on the other two. And he's great on the slab too. He's absolutely gone. Right? Yeah, but yeah, he's got nothing on the other two. <laughs> and then Peter pulls up in this old car, and having uf- driven all the way from Scotland. And the ufology sign says. Gone to Mars, be back soon. Who wrote that? Because it's in extremely poor taste. (laughs) Like, I don't think the ladies in the post office wrote that. No, maybe Lloyd did it before he went out to the cottage. Maybe, but it's... Because he's going to close the center for the night. But now that he's dead, it's really bad taste. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And then... He's looking for Christian, driving in his little fancy car... All the way from Scotland without goggles. In a car without a windshield. Yeah. But he's very fancy. He is indeed. And then Harry is not only a big jerk, but he's so stupid. Because he admits to killing Stephen when they think that they are asking about, about killing Lloyd. Lloyd. Yeah. and the But the actor, John Woodvine, does such a good job because he's like, well, I had to. He was sleeping around on my daughter. And then they're like, but we're asking about Lloyd. And he's like... Oh, like he gets that and look on his face like, wow, I'm really her. dumb. Do you think he means his daughter or Sally there? I think he means his daughter. I think like, so. I love my daughter and I couldn't yeah. stand what he was doing to her. Now, hang on. Whoa, I didn't admit. Oh, yeah, I did. I did. Oops. Oops. <laughs> and then Peter breaks into Christian's house and he gets the little shock. Yeah. <laughs> they must have had like a little... um like when they were rehearsing and doing their like just like table readings for this episode, they, maybe they brought in like a special coach to coach the actors who were going to have to be electrocuted. So Tom and and Troy and Peter um, and uh, Steve, and they were like, okay, so how do you how do you respond when you're being electrocuted? Do you know how to do the? You know, no, no, grit your teeth more, more, shake, shake faster, faster. There's, there's a thing. <laughs> In one of the DVDs, an extra, where, Bar- uh, where John Nettle talks about this, and he says Troy does a much better job than he does. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, poor Peter, you think he's going to die because he's much older. He's, he's a lot older. He's having, like, palpitations. <laughs> I think he his the actor who plays him, the younger version, kind of looks like him. Yeah, me. I think they did a pretty good job with both of them. The other, uh, the young Christian Aubrey looks nothing like he. Oh, I think they're all right. Uh, Meanwhile, Dave and Sally are going to go to Holland. He's got two tickets for paradise. I mean, the ferry to Holland. <laughs> Pick me up at 9 p.m. 9 p.m. This will be important later on because we're going to show you clearly how it's not 9 p.m. And how they're so... Stupid. Yes. They're just stupid. It's all the same people, but in different seats from my the notes, last time. My <laughs> note says, sure is sunny at 9 p.m. at night. 
<laughs> so they take the old dudes to the hospice so that they can see Isabel. Isabel die, even though the machine that goes ping is still clearly going ping. I don't think she's dead. I don't. She can't be dead. The machine's <laughs> going ping. <laughs> no, I don't think she's actually dead yet, but she's definitely on her way out. Oh, she's on her way out, even though she has that strong regular heartbeat. It's ping. Pr- it's pretty fast on that EKG, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Ah, well. But Aubrey did not kill Lloyd. I've never killed anyone in my life. Well, except for the house I built that killed the. Other but that people. was an accident. It was. It was an accident. No, it wasn't. <laughs> what were you thinking was going to happen? <laughs> Meanwhile, it's awfully bright for nine o'clock. As yeah. You said. <laughs> Sally and Dave. Uh. Prove themselves to be even dumber criminals. The worst criminals ever. Okay, <laughs> you have your ill-gotten booty in a house in which you've killed somebody. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you must have transported him to the crop circle in his car, so there's probably blood and stuff like that. On Is Lloyd found in the same crop circle that Fields was, or is I, it another one? I don't did, know. Did Dave time travel again and I make another time? Do not know. <laughs> Harry's entire field is just, just a crop circle now. Crop circles as <laughs> far as the eye can see. <laughs> they get their booty at 9 p.m. in broad daylight <laughs> because they have they have tickets. Sorry, the, she says, I'll pick you up at 9 mm-hmm. because the two tickets to Paradise or Holland are at, two or, at 2 or something like that. So they pull up to the cottage after 9 o'clock and it's still bright daylight. Yes. You can't see the sun in the horizon, that's no. for sure. But so, by the time they're being super stupid, it is dark. Okay, because... If you're doing this illegal act thing where you're going to take a bunch of silver, do, do they not have cops on, <laughs> on ferries who would go, wait a minute, you have a car full of silver. We're sophisticated it's, antique dealers. It's my grands. Sally it's would just grands. flash her boobs. I, I guess. What you need is some tunes. Turn wow. it up, baby. Turn it up, baby. I love this song. We're on. We're home free. Yep. They're jamming. <laughs> And then I love the car chase. <laughs> so the car chase happens because Tom and Troy interrupt them. Troy goes after Sally. We never see Sally again, and we never see Troy with Sally again. Dave completely ditches her. Gets in the car and drives away, and Dave is worried, right? He's worried. Barnaby's on his tail. But This needs some yakety sax, too. Yakety sax is the song from Benny Hill, by the way. If you don't know. It's very narrow country roads, winding roads. Barnaby is on his tail. And he makes a sudden turn. Dave turns. And Bar- loses Barnaby momentarily. But to Dave, I'm jamming to the music. He's now. home free now. He's I can adjust the free. tunes. I can adjust the tunes. Oh, wait a minute. They're staticky. Oh, wait, there's a UFO. Oh, I'm dead in the combine. So here's a tip to criminals. If you are in a car chase, just turn. You'll be fine. That's all you need to do. All you got to do is just turn. One road, the cops, they won't figure it out. They'll never find you. He's a pretty good dead body, too. Uh, he spat it on his own hood, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. He's just lucky that combine wasn't running. So if you're a criminal and you're killed in a jurisdiction, right? Mm-hmm. They got to put you in the ground when they know who you are. Right. They probably don't need like a big marker or anything for you. Right. Okay, then why would you have the same pitiful marker for a criminal as you do Stephen? <laughs> Let's just describe this for people who don't remember. The, the church graveyard, not only is it very overgrown, it's like nobody mows it, no. right? But when we see Stephen's grave, this is during Lloyd's funeral, we pan across Stephen's grave and Stokes's grave, and they're like post-it notes on crosses. Not only are they two pieces of wood barely tacked together to make a cross with some like flowers that somebody just kind of like dumped on top, but their names, they don't even bother like with a Sharpie on the wood. No. It's like somebody wrote it on a post-it. And, Badly. And like just stuck it on there. Like I had to go back and read it because <laughs> it says Edward Field. When we first started talking about that, I said, well, you know, they put temporary markers on a grave until the gravestone is ready. But even those would have had like a laminated name. Yeah. At least. Something. It's like a pet cemetery. So it's Lloyd's funeral. Steve and Eddie are buried in a pet cemetery. Yes, I would agree. 
the grave next to them should say like lucky or spot. Yes. <laughs> Then we see Lloyd's grave, which is dug much better. Yeah, right. It actually he's looks nice. Casket. He's got a casket, and they've it, got the the soil built up on one side, and they've got the turf over it to make it look nice. And they've got lots and lots of flowers. And they have this giant UFO that they kind of drop on the head of the casket. It barely fits. Yep. Never mind that the grave is only about two feet deep. It's and, and then there's this high crane shot that ufo is going to poke up out of the dirt it is it's so shallow it should be his grave marker i guess i guess <laughs> so barnaby's in maybe the it says maybe those symbols around the outside edge say lloyd barnaby in the back of the house is reading some comics that he found upstairs that he was going to get that he read as a kid that he was going to give to a boy if they had a boy but mm-hmm. they had cully and of course, girls don't like comics. Okay. No. Girls like comics, okay. too. Okay. But then I'm like, oh my gosh, Dan Dare comics. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went all nerd. Which are real comics. Dan Dare, pilot of the future from the 50s and in Eagle magazine. Like, they, those look like reprints. Yeah. I don't think those are originals. Uh, wow, that's a new level of nerd for you. <laughs> They're not originals. They're not first edition comics. They're reprints. Because the colors are so good. Oh, God. And, of course, Joyce is Push like... Push your glasses up on your nose. <laughs> Joyce is like, let's throw um, them out. Um, Actually, those are reprints. But what Tom's really into is a comic about Mekon. Yes. The alien. Yes. With the gigantic head. And he says, come over here, and in a few moments, you will see a sight in which you never forget. <laughs> is that's, it Uncle Harry? <laughs> yeah, that's what Mekon says. Yeah. And Tom says, when I was a kid, I was always worried he was hiding under my bed. Tom's bed must have been like five feet off the ground because Mekon's head is really effing big. How did you get that giant noggin <laughs> under my bed? <laughs> I just imagine baby Tom, little Tom laying in his bed. He hears a noise under the bed. He's like, oh no, it's Mekon. Is it you, Mekon? And Mekon says, Yes, it's me. I'm under your bed. My head is stuck. Please help me. (laughs) My huge noggin is stuck under your bed. (laughs) Come, you will see something you will never forget. My head stuck under your box screen. (laughs) Okay, best corpse of the episode. We already know who this is. Well, we've got, I don't know, there's kind of a tie between Ronald Stokes and Eddie Field. Who are both unnamed. The, these actors deserve a slow clap. Yeah. We've got Ronald Stokes, Eddie Field, Stephen Ramsey, who is a good corpse. I don't even know how Harry identifies him. He's yeah. charcoal. <gasps> <laughs> Puts his hand over his mouth. Lloyd, Dave Rippert. Yeah. And... You would, you might argue Lady Aubrey, Isabel. No, I think she dies. I don't think she dies on camera. Okay. But Ronald Netty certainly yeah. win Best Corpses Way of the Way ahead week. of everything. So let's talk about after the credits. Okay. So after the credits, I want to, the, the ladies in the post office now have a vacancy in the back of the post office. Right. Because the ufology center no longer has oh, anybody to run it. Lady Beatrice might run the ufology center. It'd be awfully sad. I bet she funds it already. Harry's going to jail. Yes. Sally's going to jail. Christian's going to jail. And Peter's going to jail. Jaily, jail, jail for everybody. I don't think Harry's going to get cell visits. No. In prison. <laughs> and what is sad is Beatrice and Lucy are left husbandless. Fatherless. Loveless. Yeah. But they're better off. They are, in the end, better off. Because Harry and Steve. It would be nice if Lloyd sort of came out from a bush and said, Oh, I faked my death. (laughs) I was just abducted by aliens. I wasn't killed. It wasn't me. And then they could all live in the the house together. But Lloyd is dead. Yeah, well, that's life, right? So So Beatrice is going to have to pull it together on her own. But yeah, like the cells in the cost of Nick are full. Yes. Harry, Sally, Christian, Peter, they're all to the pokey. If Peter hadn't come from Scotland, he might have got away with it. Yeah, yeah. He came it's really Isabel causing crap yet again. Yet again, yeah. Because if Isabel had chosen between them instead of having them fight, Peter would have never sent assassins after nope, Christian. never. So Ronald Stokes would not have died in their house. Nope. So Lloyd would have not had to create the crop circle and put the body in it, which means that when Eddie Field died, Dave Rippert wouldn't have had a crop circle to put a dead body in. And it means that 
Stephen Ramsey, well, well, he would still be dead. Well, no, Sir Harry wouldn't have an excuse to electrocute him. He'd kill him some other way. Yeah, he probably would have killed him some other way. And Lloyd, and Lloyd wouldn't be dead because they wouldn't be on the run because they wouldn't, the cops wouldn't even be in town. Yeah, it's just, it's... It's all Isabel's fault. It's all Isabel's fault. For a dying lady, she makes problems. She's very selfish. Or at least she was when she was younger. Agreed. At her grim picnic. Well, she's selfish too. Come see me, Peter, so you could get arrested. <laughs> Well, that's not too bad, though. You've been trying to kill my husband for years. I guess. Ah, well. So, Midsummer Maniacs on Twitter is at Midsummer Maniacs, and on Instagram is at Midsummer Maniacs. Now, wait a minute. What? That's not how we... That, that... Oh, well. Isabel's a jerk. That's how we end the episode? That's how well, we... How end... are we going to end the episode? So ends the most epic dead body acting episode of Midsummer. Absolutely. There's... Dead body acting in the rest of the series that never surpasses this. Never. Never. And just bravo. Yes. Sheer bravery for an actor. Slow clap. Bravo. 39 seconds of nakedy nakedness, butt hair, and not a breath. (laughs) So ends the electric vendetta. (laughs) Uh, If you have a a disagreement as to who the uh, best corpse was, which... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to go to the mat on this one. <laughs> um, or some other explanation of how Dave managed to create crop circles in an afternoon to put a body in. Or something about after the episode that we missed. Let us know. Absolutely. We are Midsummer Maniacs on Instagram and Twitter. Mm-hmm. And we're on the Facebook groups, uh, Midsummer uh, Murderers Official and Acorn TV Fans. Mm-hmm. You can get a hold of us on email at midsummermaniacs at gmail.com. And we are on all the podcast sites that you ever want to listen to. Please rate and review us if you can. It helps. It helps other people find us. Absolutely. Uh, so what's our next episode? The next episode is season four, episode four, Who Killed Cock Robin? And boy, let me tell you, episode of Coinky Dinks. <laughs> <laughs> so if you I want- just happened to be going along here. What do you know? So if you want to hear about the crazy coin dinks coincidences in the next episode, we hope you'll tune in. So until then, see you later, maniacs. Bye, maniacs. Should I make a a bad noise for the audio so you can find it? (laughs) You'll see that in the signature, right? (laughs) No, I'm just going to have... (laughs) Bin man! Bin man! Bin man! (laughs) Just going to have separate audio files. Okay.